G'day, I'm here with John Smart, all the way from San Francisco, I'm in Melbourne. We're here to talk about Future Day. John, how are Hello, you? Doing great, how are you? I'm um, great. So is there anything you'd like to say about Future Day? Yeah, I've got three uh, comments for the audience. Uh, first, I have some general comments about it, and then love to talk about some Future Day rituals, uh, just throw a few ideas out there, and then finally talk about types of futures thinking, because I'm a futurist. Sounds good. So what are the general um, comments, then, you'd like to say about future? Well, you know, my focus is accelerating change, so I like to understand w where things are going and which things are going faster every year, and those are information technologies, communications technologies, and nanotechnology. So uh, it's a very special subset of things. And, you know, we're on the edge of understanding that our future is going to be astoundingly different from the world that we live in and have lived in these last several generations. So when we recognize that accelerating change is going on all around us, we start to see the transformative solutions that are at hand for all of our problems. Uh, we just have to have the courage and the foresight to see them because they're all around us. And I think Future Day helps us to foresee both our personal potentials and to acknowledge that we have the power to pull together and really push forward the whole global system to a whole new level. Um, so, you know, we're on the edge of much more collective intelligence and resiliency and diversity and creativity and adventure as a species. And that's really what Future Day is about, I think, is helping people recognize that. Uh, getting them excited about it, and we don't have to wait for permission. We can start celebrating it now uh, ourselves and uh, with the others uh, that uh, who see the vision. So I think the other comment I'd like to make about Future Day that's general is that, you know, humanity, the ship of humanity has been slogging in a tunnel for many, many years, many, many generations of very primitive technology. And we finally see an opening and a light at the head ahead of us. And so now, really now, is the time to start rowing harder. Now's the time not to just back off and, and expect some other people to take us there. But when you see the light, when you see the island ahead, that's when you push hard. We're, we're on the edge of being connected up to each other high definition, high quality, with incredible uh, digital tools. We're going to have true internet television. We're going to have a web that we can speak to, what we call the conversational interface, interface, a web that understands us. We're going to have avatars that have primitive models of us that do things for us when we're too busy and we're asleep. We're going to have telepresence that works, a wearable web, augmented reality. We're going to have life logs recording our experiences and sharing them with others, personal robotics, robocars, sensors everywhere, global transparency to find the bad actors in the world and hold them accountable, a whole new level of digitally enhanced democracy, uh, and a lot more wealth, a whole lot more wealth coming because there's so much creativity and productivity coming from our machines. A lot of disruption, too which means we have to be lifelong learners because technology is putting us out of work as fast as it's creating new wealth. But uh, Future Day really can help people see those things and seize the positives because there's a whole lot of positives in the middle of all that disruption. So that's, those are the main general comments I'd like to make. That, that very inspiring, John. I, I like actually uh, the way you uh, phrase things. It's, yeah. I, <laughs> You've got a way with words, and it's and it's really good. I think it's very inspiring. Um, you mentioned um, that uh, you mentioned that it's going to be very different in the future. Um, I happen to agree with you. Now, if we were to say today, this day would be very different to someone 500 years ago. Do you think the future is going to be as different to people um, 500 years ago compared to today? to people today compared to 500 years from now? Or is it going to be much more different? Well, I think it depends on which sphere you're talking about. Uh, you know, futurists like to talk about steeps, science, technology, economics, environment, politics, and society. And I think some of those spheres, like uh, science and technology, are going to be very different from today. 
going to be so much more complexity. Most of it's going to be hidden under the hood, so the average person won't see it. Like, consider all the complexity that's under the hood of your Prius. It's not your father's or grandfather's car, but it looks the same above the hood. Uh, but I think uh, a lot of the things in our general environment, in, uh, in politics, in society, uh, for flesh and blood human beings, they're going to look pretty much the same as they have for many, many generations because um, people like things that are familiar to them. But um, there's going to be a whole lot of people that are not just uh, unaugmented human beings. There's going to be a lot of people that uh, really are intimately connected to their technologies, and those people are going to have electronic and biological versions of themselves. And I think their electronic selves are going to be very different, while their biological selves might be quite what we'd recognize today. So I think it depends on what uh, sphere you're looking at. You know, some things, the more they change, the more they stay the same, and other things uh, accelerate. And I think it's important to see the difference between those two. Okay. Well, it certainly seems as though we do have the wind behind us. Um, Moore's law is increasing. Um, and that seems to be applying to a lot of other technologies rather than just transistors on microchips. So yeah, the the winds in the sails, all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. The seas may be hard. The seas so may be like choppy, but um, so let's persist fur further. But I mean, let's let's get to the right island. Let's get to the right shore and not end up on the um, the rocky ones. Not, not, there you go. So um, would you like to say talk something? about rituals? Yes, rituals. Okay, well, you know, this is a new holiday. We have basically a blank slate to talk about, uh, to create whatever rituals we want that matter to us. So I'm going to suggest a few, and I hope to see a whole lot more on the Future Day website. Um, first off, uh, this is a holiday that's two months into the new year, March the 1st. Uh, so think about the closest ritual that we have right now to future day and I would say it's the New Year's resolutions. The great thing about March the 1st is it's two months after you've made your, your resolutions if you have. So you can take a look at them. Are they still working? Uh, do you need to adjust them? Uh, now's the time to basically go back and update those plans, pull them out again, make sure that you're really working on them rather than set the plans and forget them, which we often do. So I think Future Day is a great time to double down on the strategies that are working and jettison the ones that aren't, that you were thinking of at the beginning of the year. Uh, another really interesting ritual for Future Day, um, something my wife and I uh, just did recently, is to look back 10 years and ask yourself, how have you changed? Consider what you were, who you were 10 years ago, how have you changed for the better? How have you changed for the worse? How have you not changed in ways that you thought you might? Um, and then when you can articulate that with y yourself and your loved ones, look 10 years out. What can you be? What will you be? What do you expect? What are the possibilities? Think about the future that you want 10 years out. Uh, for yourself, for your family, for whatever groups you're part of, and that's visioning, isn't it? It's an important future skill. Uh, another ritual that you can do, besides the 10 years back and 10 years out, is uh, ask yourself, what if? Open yourself to possibilities. Uh, futurists call this scenarios. What possible scenarios could you see for yourself? These aren't plans, these aren't strategies, these are possibilities. What if you did this? What if you got your PhD? What if you took that job? Uh, uh, what if you took a risk and did a startup? What if you went back to school? Whatever. Figure out what those possibilities are and what if then? And I think that's a really valuable thing we can do uh, for ourselves and with others on Future Day. I hope to see a lot of people in coffee shops on Future Day because Coffee shops are a great place to sit down and have your third space, get some caffeine in your veins or tea or whatever your fancy is, and uh, look out. Look out ahead and open yourself up to possibilities. I think a, um, a fourth habit you can consider is uh, 
reading a book about the future. You ask yourself in a t topic you care about, um, who's writing about it? Find out uh, what the, uh, uh, what books are available in that topic. Go to Amazon or another good website that has collaborative filtering AI systems, weak AI that will recommend to you good books on that topic. Uh, spend the money on the book, reward the author, reward the foresight, and you'll find out uh, who's making big bets on that topic. You know, who's got plans, who's got money behind uh, a particular strategy or, or a policy. Um, and where are the trends headed? You know, what do the numbers say? What are the uh, um, performance curves and learning curves and, uh, and the history of uh, the improvement of the technologies and the, and the uh, uh, science and the other things that are important to the future of that topic? And what are the key leaders in that field say? So I think reading a book about the future um, is again a, a wonderful habit and then uh, the next one I would suggest is actually once you've done those things to do a plan do a personal strategic plan and it's like a company plan you're looking out uh, one year to three years uh, something that's doable something where the you know life's going to change and it's going to change your plans somewhat but the act of planning is going to get you closer to your goals um, Companies, startups that make uh, business plans actually survive much better at five years than startups that don't. An important thing to remember about plans is you plan light and you plan often. So don't make it a long plan, keep it to a page or two. And don't do it once every five years, do it at least once every year or, or a couple of times a year. So that you can get better and better at actually updating your self model, knowing who you are, knowing what you can do, knowing how long it'll take, how much effort, how much resources to do that thing that you're interested in. And you'll get to know yourself better, you get to know your potential better. Um, a good book I recommend in that is Strengths Finder 2.0. If you take the Strengths Finder 2.0 test in the back of the $15 book, which you can get at Amazon, uh, it'll tell you what your top five strengths are. And that's a great way to update your self model. You'll know what your strengths are. The book will give you suggestions for things to do uh, that jobs and, and uh, um, functions and uh, skills, uh, careers that will reward the strengths that you have. And it's much easier to become excellent uh, in a, a job, on uh, a team, working with your core strengths than it is to try and improve all those things that you're not good at. What's better instead is to find out what all those strengths are and be able to build a team of other people that have those strengths that you don't have so that you have what's called a cognitively diverse or a strengths diverse team. So, But the first step is really getting to know yourself and so I think all those things are important to planning. Um, got two more to suggest as possible rituals. Uh, the second to last one is to join an online group that's concerned about the future. Um, find there's a whole lot of them on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and other social networks. Figure out how to share your best stories, uh, your best ideas for the future on that group. Uh, edit a wiki page if the group has a wiki or go to Wikipedia and edit a page on something you're interested in. Fix a mistake. Uh, uh, it's quite easy to do. And by doing that, you're building what we call collective intelligence, which is the smartness of the web itself, what Werner Vinge calls your outsourced cognition, your extern the external global brain. That's what all of us are working on, as well as our own uh, activities, right? Uh, the web is the single greatest construction project humanity has ever been engaged in, and the web is going to get closer and closer to waking up, the more effort we put into making it smart. So uh, when you realize that, you can become a digital activist, you can become a digital adopter, you can put your effort into learning that new smartphone, buying it every a new one every year rather than every three years, getting on that leading edge and subsidizing innovation. And uh, all of those things I think are really helpful uh, uh, when you're thinking about uh, 
joining an online group and being as digitally active as you can. And the last ritual I would suggest is uh, um, if you're really interested in foresight, find out where the professional uh, foresight options are. If you go to globalforesight.org, you'll find a directory that a group I'm affiliated with has created. And it's a directory of foresight degrees and programs and courses and foresight literature, um, people who are professional futurists. Um, and uh, it's a conferences and events about the future. And so it's a great place to go to find out, uh, you know, what the professionals are uh, doing. And a professional just means somebody who gets paid to look ahead. And there's a whole lot of people doing it. And there's more and more people every year, the more interesting the future gets. So um, I think that's the last set of rituals I would suggest. And uh, um, I'm sure and I hope there's going to be a whole lot more suggested on future day. Definitely. Uh, they're, they're a great number of rituals. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to get that book you suggested. It's interesting that a lot of rituals that we have today um, focus on what's happened in the past, um, Christmas and um, uh, Easter, um, the cyclical rituals or whatnot. And it, um, I think we need more that focus on the future. Like you could say New Year's Day does, in a sense. You, you highlighted something I, I haven't really... Um, Thought of in conjunction with future day, and that was New Year's Day, and um, having a New Year's resolution for sure. That's that's really interesting, but it's not very honed. It's not very specific. Um, but future day seems to be able to bring uh, quite a lot of specificity in how you think about the future, and also um, a forum for getting groups together. I mean, I I recommend that people do um, have panels as well on the day, or um, get-togethers and, and group discussions on this topic. Um, and if well said. It sounds like an excellent ritual to add to the list. I hope yeah. I hope you guys set up a a wiki or a web page that uh, lists those rituals. Uh, That's exactly what I, um, well, wh what, what I want to do. Well, what what I wanted what we want to do is solicit photographs and what whatnot and um, and just uh, mention what happened uh, around the world in this day. Um, it might be a bit difficult if yeah maybe I should set up a wiki. Uh, that um, people can go in and contribute their own stuff to. You do it on a Google site. I think that's actually the easiest of all the wikis. That's what uh, globalforesight.org is set up on. It's quite easy to share, uh, for, for quite easy to edit and to give editing privileges. Mm -hmm. Sure. Cool. All right. All right. Well, um, you you are actually a futurist yourself, uh, and um, you mentioned that you were going to uh, uh, talk about. Um, Futurism in general, and maybe some of your views in the future. So yeah, yeah. So why don't I uh, conclude with uh, kind of my take on the types of futures thinking? Um, there's a famous futurist named Roy Amara, who was one of the people who started the Institute for the Future in the '60s out here in uh, Palo Alto, close to where I live in Mountain View. And he said there's basically three P's you need to think about when you think about the future. Uh, the possible future, what could happen. The probable future, what we expect to happen regardless of what we do as individuals. What the collective future seems to be um, with a high probability. And then finally, the preferable future, which is the future that each of us steers toward with our own plans and agendas. So we've got the possible, the probable, and in the middle between the possible and the probable are the preferable. A good way to think about possible futures is to think about evolutionary processes. Now I'm holding my left hand up here, and uh, if, you, if you remember Darwin's Tree of Life, evolutionary processes are constantly creating variety, starting from one thing perhaps, but they're creating lots of different types more species, more diversity, more specialization, and then the size of the bush just gets larger and larger, so the wealth of an evolutionary process gets uh, uh, higher and higher over time. So biology does this, social systems do this, technology does this, and our species has, is generating more wealth in terms of knowledge, in terms of technical capacity, in term, and in terms of material uh, um, wealth, 
products and services that we can create over time. So that's that's the possible future. And you can't really predict very often where that's going, except that the, the tree is going to have more branches on it. Now, my right hand is the probable future. And the key image isn't a tree. It's a funnel. A probable future is taking all the chaos, all the evolutionary chaos out of the system, and it's hitting a future target. All the roads are leading to Rome. And there's lots of examples of things that we consider highly probable. Uh, science and technology are going to continue to advance. Nanotechnologies are going to get smaller. Robotics are going to continue to advance. Uh, information and communication technologies are going to get better. The web's going to get smarter. Uh, we're going to see increased personal freedoms in all of the uh, open societies. And there'll be more open societies. We'll see increased rights for the average individual. Social safety nets will go up as the wealth goes up. And we'll see greater wealth. Uh, greater disruption at the same time, possibly greater rich-poor divides in the wealthiest countries, but greater wealth. And so uh, we can see a lot of things that we expect to come. Uh, the conversational interface, the cyber twin, um, a symbiont network is another developmental or um, highly probable future. A symbiont network is a world where uh, once we all have 24-7 high definition, uh, uh, high bandwidth connections wired and wireless between us, there's going to be groups of kids, 150 kids, all connected up with each other, cognitively diverse, uh, strengths diverse, and all those kids are going to outperform kids that aren't connected because they're going to have a lifeline, if you will, to 150 other specialists, the future uh, lawyer, the future doctor, the future engineer, the future basketball player. Uh, you've got a network of all these kids connected up. You can pretty much make a case that it's highly probable that those connected up kids, that symbiont, is going to outperform kids that aren't connected. So that's probable thinking. So we've got the possible, we've got the probable, right? And in the middle between the possible and the probable is the Roy Amara's third type of thinking. That's the preferable future. Those are all those pyramids, all those peaks that we want to reach, all the goals we're heading toward. We may or may not get there, but that's where, we're, that's where we want to go. Those are where our values take us. And of course, there's lots of values in society, so there's lots of preferable peaks. You've got the people for ethical treatment of animals, uh, and they have their one preferable future. You've got the pe people who say, I love animals, they're very tasty, and they've got their peak that they're heading toward. And those peaks don't necessarily um, play well together, right? So there's multiple pluralistic agendas in any uh, complex society. So you've got the possible, the probable and the preferable. A good way to think about it, uh, Jacob Bernowski, um, famous philosopher said, is when you're thinking about the possible, you're putting on your artist hat. When you're thinking about the probable, you're putting on your scientist hat. The things I can predict. The things I can create, the things I can predict. And then when I'm thinking about the goals that I want to reach toward, I'm putting on my manager hat or my politician hat. I got to work together with other people as a manager or a politician and steer toward those things. So you're an artist, you're a scientist, and you're a manager politician. All of us do all three of those things. So if you can ask yourself, what are my possible, probable, and preferable futures? I think you're doing a really good job of covering the space of the futures that matter to you. Awesome. I like that. Okay. Thanks. So, um, I've got a, a, um, a couple of questions. It's, it's specifically technological oriented because that's my interest. So, how do you think we can um, use FutureDay to uh, 
increase the likelihood um, or bias the odds of ethical um, and beneficial uh, technology in the future. I think that uh, you can connect up the people who see the value of Future Day through um, an online platform that captures all the interesting ideas people have asynchronously, a thing like a wiki, right? But I think you can also add the synchronous uh, aspects that you all, that you talked about that I hadn't thought much about by having meetups, by having hangouts. Um, I think um, it would be great to see a bunch of people um, pushing those thin pipes that all of the uh, um, cable companies and telecommunications companies have given us, clogging them up, slowing them down, and uh, making them all work harder to upgrade those pipes. Because uh, there's a lot of upgrading they need to do before you and I have uh, gigabit broadband. Uh, Google is going to build it out in Kansas City this year, so we're going to see what gigabit broadband looks like. The entire country of Korea is going to have gigabit broadband by the end of this year. They've pledged it. But the United States is going to be a long ways away from that kind of, uh, of uh, ability for us all to connect up with each other in virtual space. So I think if we push it, uh, we're going to get there faster. And uh, I think that's one thing that we can do um, every year. It would be really neat to see um, Future Day have some kind of measure for your impact every year in terms of uh, the number of people that have edited the wiki, the number of um, uh, hangouts you've had. And, of course, deciding what things you want to measure is going to be uh, one way of signaling to other people what they should be doing more of, you know posting in social networks, uh, uh, tweeting, um, sending me uh, SMS messages to each other, uh, all the things that we can do that uh, get us towards that global brain I was talking about earlier, which is this uh, extended set of um, uh, external resources that really help us live better lives. Um, and, uh, you know, the more complex society gets, the more great solutions there are, the more great strategies and tools and services there are, and the more we all have to learn to be like that New Year's baby you see uh, every New Year. We have to be like a little baby uh, and push out the old man in us at the end of the last year and look at the world again with fresh eyes, because if we don't do that, we're going to miss all those amazing new opportunities. You know, tools like P Interest, which has blown up to 10, th 10 uh, million users in, what is it, half the time it took Facebook to reach its first 10 million users. And Facebook did it in half the time it took, uh, you know, the previous social networks. So the speed is just going to keep going up, and the, and the number of interesting tools and platforms is going to keep going up. So we got to think of ourselves as kids as little babies every um, every so often in order to open ourselves up to those possibilities.